So welcome everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. For those of you who join us for the first time, American Purpose is new. It's 10 months old. It's online publishing and podcasts and Zoom discussions and real life conferences we think and hope very soon. The mainstay of our work, as many of you do know, is politics and public policy, domestic and international. But we do include, integrate, and care deeply about culture. In fact, if I may say, it turns out after 10 months operating that 60% of our listeners, readers, viewers are 35 years old and younger. And there is by all accounts, interest, engagement, and hunger for culture, film, music, theater, art, architecture, which I think is, I may say, in times like these, it is really encouraging and heartening. I wanna thank Sid Lipset, my colleague. She leads our arts and culture program. She is a spectacular impresario and she is responsible for this program today. Sid, great to see you. And thanks for helping and leading and shaping this program. To all of you, a quick word about format. We run an hour hard stop, respectful of your time, wherever you are, whatever coast or even country. So we'll wrap up at 7 p.m. Eastern. The first 30 minutes, give or take, will be a conversation between our two guests of honor. I'll introduce them in just a moment. And then the remainder of the time, 20, 25, 30 minutes, q and I'm delighted to have the role of facilitating that. I'll call on you or read your questions from chat. But now, no further ado, this is going to be very good and stimulating and I think great fun. David Thompson joins us again. David, it's great to see you and so kind that you make time for us again. David Thompson is a leading film critic. He is a wonderful historian, a book author. His current most recent book, which is 2021, Alfred Knopf, I hold it up. I'm not very good at this with Zoom, but it is a light in the dark, a history of movie directors. David, congratulations. Congratulations on that. We'll hear more about that in moments. And for the first time with us today, and I hope not the last time, Douglas McGrath, screenwriter, actor, director. And if you know anything about films like Emma, Bullet Over Broadway, <laughs> Bullets Over Broadway, Nicholas Nickleby, the list is long. You have the bio, but, but this is a, a spectacular opportunity for us, Douglas, to have you because you know this industry at the highest level from so many different vantage points. And I'm given to understand you two gentlemen know each other and for some time. So Douglas, I'm gonna to turn to you to start us off to begin this conversation with your friend, David, take it any which way we're wide open and then we'll have a Q and A when you're ready. But Douglas, welcome, David, welcome. And Douglas, you have the floor. All right, thank you for having me. We're, uh, I'm delighted to be here with all of you and with David. Uh, the question I'm gonna throw at, at David to start us off is, uh, which I hope leads to a whole discussion of how we see movies now, but how did you, what was the first movie? Tell me about, tell all of us about your first movie going experience. Where were you, what was the movie and what was that experience like? I was on the laps of my parents at Henry V the Olivier Henry V, and I would have been four. Wow. And as you might imagine, some of the Shakespearean verse passed over my head. But <laughs> at about the halfway point in that film, the knights come on on horseback. And I understood knights on, on horseback. And I loved that film until if you remember the play, there is a moment when the French raid the English camp and set fire to it. And several page boys are killed. Uh, and on screen, I saw the faces of sleeping page boys and flames. I believed I was seeing children on fire, which when you're four is a startling thing. 
and I had to be taken out of the theater screaming in tears. No one explained to me what a superimposition was or what a dissolve <laughs> was. So I was taken out to the lobby by my father who was very in indignant about it because I had spoiled his entertainment. And he stopped me crying and I immediately said, I want to go back in. <laughs> that was the first time. <laughs> what was your first time? Uh, as David knows, I am from West Texas, from a town called Midland, which is all dirt and dust. It's just all dirt all the time. And the first film I saw was also set in England, but of a very different uh, nature than the one you saw, which was Mary Poppins. And if you're in Midland, Texas, and the tumbleweeds blow down the main street, and the wind is blowing, the dust is hitting your window all the time, and you go into the Howard Hodge movie theater, which was so named because it was owned by a man named Howard Hodge, um, and the, the screen opens up. In those days, we still had curtains. We had two curtains at the Howard Hodge, the big heavy one and the thinner one. And then that movie starts, and you're in Hollywood, London, and that ravishing color, uh, uh, still Technicolor, and Julie Andrews coming out of the sky, you think, well, uh, I want to come here every day for the yes. rest of my life. Yeah. And just imagine if, by the magic of the movies, as those page boys were on fire and I was beginning to scream, Mary Poppins had appeared and had spoken out into the theater and said, don't worry, dear boy, it's all right. <laughs> I love that you're... Sugar. I love that your first experience was tears and horror fleeing the theater and yet it began your life's work. Absolutely, and it, there was an extraordinary feeling of compulsion about it. I remember my father tried to explain to me how projection worked, you know, I mean, how the movies functioned. I, I, I thought he was making it all up. It was so complicated. I believed there were human beings within or behind the screen. And I have never lost that feeling that there is a life up there that one oh, yeah. might, that we might join in. Well, among the things, and I, I, I by, by no means of the, uh, of the belief that uh, everything now is bad, I'm not. But one of the things I miss about that kind of movie going, by which I mean pre-digitized films, was that wonderful sense sometimes when you were sitting in the theater, if you were close enough to the back, you could hear the, oh, you know, that wonderful magic whir of the projector. You do it very well. Would you do it again? <laughs> Once more, please. No, that's you know, it. it's, that's the you, noise, yes. The association, I mean, I'm sure you have it, that I have with it, it's, it's, it's immediately transporting, relaxing and joyful. Totally, and, and uh, you know, People don't realize this now, but in those days, before Mary Poppins maybe, you could sit back in your seat in the theater and you could look up and there was the projector beam, a solid oh, yeah. wedge of light filled with cigarette smoke. <laughs> and if, if the movie got boring, you could watch the shapes of the smoke swirling in the projector. In, in those years, not so much in my youth, but it was for me, but in, in the golden years of movie going, every part of the experience was wonderful. That smoke, the light, the curtains, the curtains alone, when they started, when they stopped having curtains, a lot of the fun went out of it for me. I love the curtains and the way the image would waver on the curtains as they came yes. together. And also, yeah. also, when the movie ended, you could sit back, you could get an ice cream and 10 minutes the movie would start again. You know, continuous performances. Uh, I loved as a kid going to a movie, not really knowing what time it would begin, getting in late. And I would watch <laughs> it round. And then I came to the point where I knew the story. And that meant all the more because then I could really join in with it. You know, I don't know about you as a kid, but we went to the movies. I mean, I, I'm sure this was not true of you, but in my case, I had no critical objection to any film I saw practically until I was in college. I loved almost everything I saw. It, it's not that I felt equally about them, but I was so happy to be in the movie theater. Um, to, it, 
you know, part of movie going in those years was, it was an excuse to get out of the house. Now, if, if it turned out that the movie was good, that was just gravy on top of it. Absolutely. But it was just, you know, that, that place you went. And I do remember the feeling when a movie would end, if we went to matinees on the weekend, you'd go in and in Midland, the sun shines like an interrogator's lamp right in your face all the time, just shattering sunlight all the time. So you go into the theater and it's dark. So already that's good. And it's cool and that's better. Yeah. And then there's yeah. something beautiful, you possibly on the screen. Uh, whatever it is, it's not middle. And so it takes you out of what you're looking at. And then you come out and I, I've always remembered this feeling of when you leave the dark theater, if it's still daylight, you have a kind of, <laughs> you feel a little seedy or something. It's such yeah. a, there's a, yeah. a, a disappointment. Yeah. Well, at returning to life. I mean, I quite early on in my career as a so-called critic, I, I sort of had this idea, which came from that childhood experience of not wanting the film to end and therefore wanting to carry the story on. Uh, and uh, uh, Red River was a great case in point. That was a key point, a Texas film, a key point in my education. And it was the first film I saw twice around, mm. but it was also a film that I couldn't bear that story ending. I could see that the father and the son had been brought together, but I wanted it to go on. And in my mind, and for nights afterwards, I would be dreaming, daydreaming about those stories going on. And that led to a, a couple of books I've written, Suspects in Silver Light, which really are about the life after the movie ends. But mm. I think that was all part of the the atmospheric power the movies had in those days. And, and just as you say, we went to the movies. I would go into the movies, I would sit down, and I literally did not know what the movie was going to be. I was there to see light on the screen and to get out of the house. Well, also, in your youth, which by the time of my youth was changing. I still had black and white and color, but it, it, we tended toward color. I'm born in 1958. And so by the time of Mary Poppins, which is 64, five, something like that, yeah, yeah, color was predominant, though it was not the only thing. What was the experience for you as a kid with black and white versus color? Did you have a feeling about one over the other? Well, uh, I suppose at the time I started, there were beginning to be nearly as many color films as black and white films. But black and white was still predominant. And I never thought about it. I never rationalized it. But I thought from the beginning that black and white was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. I still think that. I think, oh, it, yeah. is one of, I, I think it is one of the great cultural achievements man has made black and white, uh, you know, it says so much about metaphor, about complex meanings, and it is just so sheer, beautiful to look at. And I preferred black and white films. I thought color was, I don't know, a little vulgar. And, and frequently it was in those well, early days. In, your, in the film you cited in Henry V, it's, it's in gorgeous color. That's oh, a, yeah. I mean, that's a vividly colored movie to start with. It's a great color film. And, you know, obviously Henry V had to be done in color. It would not have been the same. Although a few years later, he did Hamlet in black and white. So, right. there, was a, so there was a sort of judgment about the emotional atmosphere of those two films. It's ironic when you think about it, because Hamlet <laughs> couldn't see things in black and white. He, he was so <laughs> lost in the gray of everything. Right. But, um, <laughs> Wait, I wanted to say about his Henry. Oh, you know, the thing about color and black and white. Uh, I made a documentary, as you know, about Mike Nichols, it yeah. was right near the Great end of his point. life. And one of the things that Mike said in the documentary was that he loved black and white because it's a way of telling the audience right from the beginning, this isn't real. This is something else. And he yeah. used what you said. He said, it's a metaphor. Uh, this story is a metaphor for something. When you put it in what we might call realistic color or something that looks more like life, 
you have to, you, you come at it, you don't see the metaphor in quite the same way, whereas black and white sets it apart. Yeah, but, but you know, we're getting into this fascinating issue that photography is famously lifelike. And that's why photography became a worldwide craze. But the longer you look at it, the more you realize that it's not life. It's something quite different. It's a world of its own. And it's saying things about life that may not be correct, true, valuable, any of those mm -hmm. things, but can be transporting and magical. And, and I think that is more clear with black and white because from the, from, the, from the outset, you know that's not the way the world looks. It's a way the world could look, ought to look. And if you think about some of our great films, I mean, Casablanca, is set in a world of sunshine. I, I, believe, I believe North Africa is very sunny, uh, but Casablanca would not work nearly as well in color, I think. Citizen Kane, again, it's, it's a film about the world of the early 20th century. It could easily be in color and a lot would be lost because of that. And, um, you know, I mean, there are- still Is that because, I do agree with you, I wouldn't want to see either of those movies in color, but it also begs the question, if we knew it in color, if that's how it had been at the beginning, maybe we'd buy it in color. Maybe, maybe it's just that we cherish it as we know it. I'm sure you're right. I, I'm sure you're right, we're suckers, but I'm just saying that <laughs> to make a color film is to say, well, I'm being true to life. To make a black and white film, immediately says, I'm being true to something else, something mm -hmm. beyond or deeper or within life. And I think that is, that is a great clue straight away, just as Mike Nichols said. You know, one of the great uh, uh, jokes, uh, unintentional jokes, I assume, in, in classic films is the choice to have made Jezebel a, a movie all about a woman wearing a red dress in yep. black and white. Yep. Now, what in the world what, I mean, if you're gonna, you know, they made several films in color that year. What would make them not make that film in color? Well, it's a Warner Brothers film. And Warner Brothers, if you remember, were relatively tentative about color. They had color for Robin Hood and a few things like that. But quite a lot of their costume adventure films are in black and white too. They simply didn't do black and white in the way some other studios like MGM were very keen right. to get into color. You would just think given that the whole thing was based on a color that wasn't black or white, uh, they might've sprung for it in that case. Yeah. <laughs> but I agree, I have to say this about black and white. What's so <clears throat> great about black and white when you see it is it gives you a whole other level to relate to the movie on in addition to the story. You know, yes. in, in in most color films, unless you're talking about someone like Powell Pressburger, who uses the color so, uh, you know, expressively, in most cases, your your eye is on the story, the acting, yeah. uh, the scene. But yeah. black and white gives you a whole other thing to, to be thrilled by if it's if it's done uh, properly. No, absolutely, and, and 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 you know, it's in that first era of Technicolor color films that noir comes alive. And it's almost as if in reaction to the possibility of color, certain filmmakers say, no, the poetry is in black and white. And film noir becomes out of nowhere, really, a genre of its own, a very low budget genre, but a genre that almost everyone now knows exists. Mm -hmm. And they know the sort of emotional atmosphere that goes with it. Let's go back a second to what we were talking about before, which is the very idea of movie going and how it's changed. Yeah. Now it's changed, as you know, for a lot of reasons. Most recently it's changed because we're not allowed to go to the movies because of COVID. But it's funny, I wonder, I wonder what you think COVID, the, the pandemic, the quarantine and the pause, uh, are we gonna come back from that? What do you think is gonna happen going forward? Well, look, don't, misunderstand me because COVID is a tragedy or we have allowed it to be a tragedy. 
But I will say this, I think COVID has also taught us a lot of truths about ourselves that we really have to come to terms with. And some people will say the public stopped going to movies because of COVID. Uh, wait a minute. The public started to stop going to movies in the 1950s because of a thing called television. And the drop off in the audience level in that era was greater than there's ever been since. And if you were going to the movies in the 10 years before COVID, you were often almost on your own there because people weren't going. And I think we've got to face the fact that two things that I see have happened. One, under COVID, because of enforced measures of lockdown, people have started watching series in a very concentrated, very binge-like way. And a lot of the virtues of narrative and writing for the screen have been rediscovered. I mean, a thing like Queen's Gambit, made by your friend Scott Frank, as good a film as there's been in the last 10 years, absolutely ravishing and gripping and compelling, interesting people, a huge entertainment. Uh, and the public knows it when they're seeing something good. If you say to the public, do you want to see The Queen's Gambit or Tenet? Well, you, you know, the numbers tell you what they decided on. But there's another thing that's, I think, much more important. Um, we both have sons who are in the sort of 20-ish, early 20-ish range. I'm not sure about your son because I'm sure you make him watch theatrical movies, but my son, Zachary, whom you know, mm -hmm. he does not go to the movies, to the no. theater, no. but he spends hours every day watching screens. And what is happening to this world and the public and the culture is that the movies, the cinema, theatrical films are being given up. I don't think they're ever going to go away, but they're being given up because people are riveted by these tiny screens that you and I can hardly see and which we think are sort of silly, but the kids don't think they're silly. The kids believe their life depends on keeping up with those screens. Well, That's where I, the future's going. I, I wanna share with you something that surprises me when I think about it, but because, you know, filmmakers and film lovers assume that the ultimate experience is, you know, the giant screen at Radio City Music Hall, or, you know, that wonderful, the big, the big experience of seeing a movie in a theater. And yet I, I am reminded, and, and of course, there's nothing quite like that. A few years ago at Radio City, uh, uh, they showed The Godfathers 1 and 2 all day. Uh, Coppola and the cast were there afterwards for questions. It was just great. And when it came to the scene, in Godfather One, when Al Pacino and Diane Keaton are actually leaving Radio City, there was this weird <laughs> freeze on the audience and everyone started clapping. But I can remember being at college in my freshman year, one afternoon, not working, of course, that was my specialty in the afternoon. And I had a TV that was, you know, about like that. Just, you could put a, you could fry a small egg on it. That's as much territory as it had. And they were showing Jack Clayton's film of The Innocents from oh, yeah. Turn of the Screw. And you know, because you've seen it, that's, I didn't know this at the time, that's a famously widescreen production. You know, it's, yep. it's as wide yep. as Colorado. And, and of course, so it was chopped up, panned and scanned, it ruined in every particular way, uh, visually, and uh, every seven or 10 minutes, there were 45 minutes of commercials. Yep. And yet, because it was so great, I, I was just spellbound. I mean, yeah. I was waiting to see what was gonna happen. I, I was gripped by as much of it as I could see that they hadn't hacked off and left someplace else. Many years later, I saw it across the street from my office here at the moment on a big, beautiful screen, uh, just as it was meant to be seen. And of course, I loved that too. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that the size, what gets you is, 
is what the story is. You know, it's, it's, it's that if they're telling you a story you want to know about, you'll watch it on your phone, you'll watch it on your big TV at home, or you'll watch it, you know, on a giant screen at a drive in. Well, that's so true. And, you know, I mean, if we go back to basics, in the old days when it was film in the camera and film in, in the editing machine, people were working with 35 millimeter frames and they would hold them up to the light to see where the image changed. Um, the, the end product would be huge and it would be special because of the size, but the work was done often on a very small scale. Mm -hmm. And when you're making a, even a cinemascope film about a big thing, you see just a couple of people in the frame. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a small stage. Well, you know, we love the experience of being in the theater and that we have a romantic and a sentimental association with it from our, our youth. But I do think this sometimes, I, I, I totally agree with you about young people. Our son loves movies, but he'd rather not go to a movie theater and see one there. Sure. He'd rather see it at home, on the phone, on his computer, any place. And it is funny when you think about it, because if you were starting from scratch, say it was all reversed and we didn't have movie theaters originally, we just had our big TVs at home or our phones, whatever way you see a movie, but it's at home. And then someone said, oh, I have a, a great new idea. We're gonna show this movie, but you have to leave your house to see it. And you're gonna go to this place and you're gonna spend quite, quite a lot of money really to, to get a ticket and you're gonna sit there with other people. You'll have to find your own seat. Um, and then you can, uh, if you want something to eat or drink, that'll be another, you know, $2,000. Um, but you know, the experience of going to a movie theater is kind of, it's what we have now is this extraordinary ease of viewing, which yep. I think has resulted in more viewing. Oh, I think it has. And you know, there's another thing that doesn't get talked about. In a lot of situations, you at home with your modern TV screen are getting an image brighter, more radiant than many people are getting in movie theaters where mm. the standards of projection are not good at all. Yeah. So the image in some ways, although it's much smaller, it looks better. You know, I, 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 I was watching the Euro soccer recently you could see whether the players had shaved or not and how many days they hadn't shaved. The detail in the imagery is just amazing nowadays. The other thing that happened in the, in the if you want to call it the war, or the jousting between TV and movies, is that through the, maybe through the 80s, maybe into the early 90s, if you wanted to see filmed entertainment of any kind of adult maturity, any kind of intelligence or sophistication, you had to go to the movies to see. It. You know, yes. TV was very much- Very tame. Uh, wide as possible audience. Yes. You got the occasional breakthrough surprise, but not, not often. Yep. And then thanks to cable, when everything changed and they could swear and take off their clothes and do all that, people started putting the mature material on television just as movies have discovered with Jaws and all those kind of wide open, you know, the multi-screen openings, they suddenly, movies became wide as possible audience. They started chasing that audience and, and the mature material went to TV. But you know, this is touching on something that I find very troubling. I remember going to the movies in the 1940s and you had to queue, you had to stand in line to get in because invariably it was packed. And I'm talking about theaters that might have hold 2000 people, mm -hmm. full. And there was an extraordinary sense of a communal entertainment, people laughing in unison, people being scared in unison. Mm -hmm. And you and I are both temperamentally devoted to the era of old Hollywood, 30s, 40s, 50s, let's say, and the kind of mass entertainment that it produced. And I think many of the filmmakers of that era were so excited, not just creatively, but almost politically. Take a Chaplin, very politically interested in the idea 
if I make a film that's funny enough, everyone's going to see it, literally everyone. And they're sort of going to laugh at the same time with it. That is a wonderful quality, not just for the art, the entertainment, but for the world. And we don't have that now. We've lost that now. And I don't know how we get it back. The musical is a great example. I mean, you love musicals as much as anyone I know. And, and you're a great admirer of, say, Fred, As Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire is one of the great, great figures in film history. And we live in a world now where it's almost unthinkable that somebody like a Fred Astaire could come along and make film after film. Hmm. Well, I, I want to say to your earlier point, I think the thing that is most lost in not seeing a movie together as a group it is, is the comedy aspect more than anything. I know what you mean about a scare, yes. It's wonderful when everybody kind of shivers together. But if a movie's funny, people laugh out loud and, in other words, laugh. And sometimes it's the joke that's making you laugh or the pratfall or whatever you're seeing on the screen. And sometimes it's the sound of other people's laughter. Absolutely, that, yeah. Which is, I'm sure why they created laugh tracks. I mean- Oh, it's a, totally. Yeah, but yeah. laugh tracks don't have that effect. It's they, in fact, they no. sometimes have the opposite effect. But yeah. real I mean, people yeah. get you going. Totally, natural laughter is one of the greatest things we have as an audience. You know, it's it's spontaneity is beyond control, and it's so natural. Uh, and you know, a lot of people laugh badly. They have raucous horrible laughs that you want to say, get that person out of the theater, that <laughs> laugh is killing it. But the community of laughs is a very important part of it. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Um, let's see. All right. Um, recently, what have you been watching? Oh, um, well, I, I was a huge fan of the Underground Railroad, and I talked about it on a previous version of this show. Uh, I think it's a great, great film, and, and um, I wish more people had seen it, not just because they'd have get, they would have had a better entertainment, but because I think we are at a time when people need to see that film or films mm -hmm. of, that, of that kind. Um, I watched something last night, A Silliness, a new show called The White Lotus. Do you know about The White Lotus? Yeah, I've seen it. I've yeah. seen it. Well, it's not deep. It's not special. But Lucy and I, my wife, we watched three episodes last night. And we finally said, well, did we, did we do a fourth? And we knew it was, we knew it was not that good. God. But it was funny <laughs> enough. And we were having a good time with it. And the people were pretty. And you know, the place was nice. You sort of wanted to be in that Hawaiian resort at the same time. It's also quite a scathing comedy about social mores. And um, I don't know anything about the guy who wrote and directed it, but we'll probably watch three more episodes tonight. So you only saw three last night? That's all, yeah. Well, just get ready. Something happens in four you may never recover from. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> It's, uh, I mean, Jane and I, I think it's in episode four. There's a thing that happens when somebody opens a door into a room and the person who opens the door is shocked, but not as shocked oh. as Jane and I were. Oh. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's lots of lurid fun. And that guy, Mike White, he's a very smart, interesting person. Yeah. Um, and I love the, the show. I thought the show had a very, um, a wonderful light touch with its satire. It was very clear, but yep. you didn't feel your nose was being rubbed in it. You were allowed to uh, it, see it at a, uh, a distance. A lot of the people in the show are jerks, but the show is not cruel towards them, if you know what I mean. Maybe in episode four, it gets cruel. <laughs> <laughs> also, I have to say the acting in the show is so good. I, I the Jennifer Coolidge is, uh, spectacular, but many people, the woman whose name I can't think of who plays the newlywed, the bride. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is just brilliant. Uh, Alexandra Daddario, I think. Wonderful. Yeah. And the guy that plays, he's not the concierge, but the Australian man oh, who plays yeah, the, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. He's yeah. just brilliant and he's part of the experience in episode four. But I mean, there is a point that's so valuable. The quality of acting down the cast list in shows these days. We learned it from things like The Sopranos where new people would be introduced and they were like better than the old people. And the quality of acting like the quality of the writing. Another thing about long form television, it's been a playground for writers. And you know, I mean, long ago, people like us would always say, value the writers more in, in filmmaking. I'm sure you'll attest to that as a writer. But long form television gives those people a lot of leeway, a lot of license and, fr and well, freedom. Well, also, you know, in television, even though writers are called executive producers, they're the writers. And so unlike movies where you have so many layers of whether well, it's a director and, and the producers are not writers, they're producers and there's the studio and we're also not writers. In right. television, I think one of the reasons, naturally, I would think this, but one of the reasons television is so good is because writers are largely in charge. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, people like David Chase, Vince Gilligan, showrunners, we call them now, they're writers. That's how they began. That's how they regard themselves. And it's a very, uh, uh, oh, sorry. It's a very literary, uh, and I don't mean literary um, in a pretentious way, but it's a, it's a literary quality. And there is a literary quality in television writing now in, in terms of not only subtle, subtlety, but imagery, um, yep. wit that didn't exist when I was growing up. No, absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's a, it's a form where people do and say very unexpected things. Um, a lot of movies never surprise you in what they do and say. Television does. There's, there's, there's more daring involved, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, gentlemen, I, I, I hate to break in and interrupt, but I do want to bring to your attention, we have about, well, not about, we have 21 minutes <laughs> remaining. If, if you would be inclined to take some questions from the audience, sound okay? Sure. Sure. So, Douglas and David, that, that was fun. I feel like we were sitting in the living room with a glass of wine, listening to two pros dig in and guide us along. And that was great fun. So raise your hand or put your question in chat. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of calling on two writers for American Purpose in this order. Matt Hansen first, Tevi Troy second. Uh, Matt, say a word about who you are. And then Teddy will get to you in just a moment. But Matt, you are usually a wonderful person to kick off with a comment or a question. Could I turn it over to you? Sure. Um, my computer's kind of crappy, so if I'm not coming through, just let me know. Um, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, I'm a contributing editor at American Purpose, um, and I had a, a review of David's uh, latest book, A Light in the Dark, that is in chat that I did um, a couple months ago now. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, David's work. I've, I've reviewed a few of his books before, and I've interviewed him, and, and uh, I've read quite a bit of his stuff. The thing that I'm curious about, and I think Douglas can speak uh, about this as well, since you are a screenwriter, um, the thing that I've always really appreciated about um, your writing, David, is that it's, it's very poetic. You, the way you were describing being in a theater before, it was, you know, the curtains and the the, the projection light and the, the whirls of cigarette smoke. I mean, I love that. And I feel like that's a lot more evocative than you would expect from like general criticism where people are kind of like, what's the plot, you know, get in, get out 500 words. And for me, and what I want to, what I wanted to, to emphasize in the review is that I have a hard time sometimes convincing people to watch films that were made prior to 2000, you know, let alone black and white. I was literally talking to some film students the other day that I bumped into at a bar and they were like, why would you watch anything before like 2005? It's boring. And so um, my, my heart kind of broke hearing that. So I wonder if like maybe having a sort of lyrical approach to criticism or, or you know, to the response of, of being a film goer might be a way to turn people on to, you know, stuff that is, that is a little bit older than just the 21st century. Um, I sort of live with the, the fear and almost the loneliness that 
very few people read film criticism, <laughs> and are, are let alone swayed by it to go and see films. I can only speak for myself. Um, when I started writing about films, the thing I wanted to do most and still want to do most is try to convey the feeling that I had watching the film. So I mean, to take an example, the very end of John Ford's The Searches, the moment when John Wayne brings Natalie Wood back after five years of search and she's restored to civilization. And you think, well, he's gonna come back into the room with her because he's part of that white society. And instead his character, Ethan, stays hesitating outside in the sunlight. He sort of sways a little and then he turns and walks into the desert. The first time I saw that film, it gave me the shudders. Uh, it still does. And I, I've written about that scene a lot. And I, it's really, for me, the atmospheric that that scene is trying to convey. And I still couldn't tell you exactly what it is but I'm gonna keep trying to describe it. And for me, that's, that's the lure in writing about films. And if you think it's poetic, I'm very happy. <laughs> I think Matt, that, I've always thought of David, not as a critic, but as a, as a novelist describe, di disguised as a critic. Yeah, that's, I tried to say lyrical criticism. I mean, there's no higher praise in my book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. Matt, can I add one thought to what, you're saying, because I, I once spoke at my son's high school and there was a kid in the audience who said is what you said, your friends have said, that th thing of anything before 2000, they don't want to be bothered with. Um, I think all of us who love classic films, one way to approach it is not to extol the virtues of classic films in general or black and white in general. You have to give them one you love. You say, listen, you need to see, and then you give them that one, pick a really great, and then if, if, if they give it a try, and it is a really great one, then they're in a little bit. Um, my wife and I, who are otherwise quite negligent parents, when our, our child was little, committed to uh, teaching him about uh, classic films. And so, because I didn't want him to just know, you know, what he would know now. And the, the best thought I had about it was to start with films in which a child was featured in an important way because I knew that would be the thing he'd connect with. And I, to remember to this day, the first film we showed him was Arthur Penn's wonderful film of The Miracle Worker, oh, yeah. which is black and white. It's, you know, it's young Helen Keller. And the first scene in that movie, <laughs> oh my God, is so dramatic right away. It's Helen Keller's in bed, little baby Helen Keller's in bed. And her mother's come in and she says, Helen, Helen. And obviously Helen's gone deaf, she can't hear her. And so the mother starts slapping her hand like this to see if she can get the baby to hear. And she does, I'm telling you, this is the first one minute of the film. And I looked at our son, he was rigid with attention in his chair, just completely focused on the screen. And he was gone from that moment on. So once a week we would, we would pick a film for a long time with a kid at the center and that helped bring him into that, to that uh, world. So, so Douglas, thank you and Matt and David, that um, segues to Tevi Troy. Tevi, would you tell us who you are? Many know, but perhaps not everyone. And Tevi Troy, would you tell us what you've written, which is appearing tomorrow in American Purpose? Tevi, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Jeff. And thanks to uh, Douglas and David for this fascinating conversation. I am a presidential historian and I'm also a former White House aide and I've written a lot about culture over the years including a book about movies and books that presidents liked and it, it talks about uh, how that has affected and shaped our, our presidents. But the piece I have in the magazine tomorrow is about the over 100 movies, all of them hopefully classics to some degree or other, but over 100 movies that I watched with my 14 year old son 
during the COVID period. I was looking for something for us to do in this period that where we could bond together. And, and that's what I chose, uh, chose to do. And it was really interesting to hear what you guys are talking about in terms of hard to get a kid to watch a movie before mm. 2005, hard to get them to watch black and white. How do you start a movie? And this is one thing I found that there were some movies that I, I really thought were terrific movies. And if it didn't grab him in the first five minutes, I had trouble getting him through the rest of the movie. And I actually, in addition to the list of over a hundred movies that I talk about in the article that we saw together, I have my own list of movies that we started and didn't quite finish. So uh, do you have any thoughts about how best to start a movie? I know Joel, Joel Silver, the famous action producer said, his theory for a movie is 10 minutes and a boom. You have to have a, a boom or an explosion or a car chase or a fight every 10 minutes. I don't think that's the way you got to do it, but there has to be some theory of how to grab an audience early on without just talking an exposition and deadly dull, um, de de deadly dull actors facing each other um, that can pull in an audience, but still allow them to think about elevated issues and, and have, a, have a real cinematic experience. Well, I'll, I'll go first. I think... I think it's like any storytelling. It's the same verbally as it would be on a screen. You've got to present a character, at least one character, who has some worry or some hope, some desire, and you know it's going to be very hard to deal with it. But I think the character has to have a quest. I think there's an element of search and mystery in many film stories. And you have to establish quite early, not with undue violence or action necessarily, but you have to establish the idea that this character wants to find out an answer that is going to inspire us to want to find out the answer too. So anyway, Doug, take it away. I, t I think that's beautifully put. One of the, I, I'm honored to have been a, an advisor at the Sundance Filmmakers Labs for many years. And one of the films I always cite in talking to the screenwriters I, I've advised, because I think it's a perfect piece of storytelling, is The Wizard of Oz. Now, you think of the beginning of The Wizard of Oz. It's right, it's just what uh, David is saying. It's this little girl coming down this path with her dog and they're worried. She's worried about something. They're getting away from Miss Gulch. So they don't do a lyrical setting up of Kansas. They don't do, they start right with the problem. Um, and, and right away she comes in and she's very upset about it. And very quickly that leads to, I have to get away from here. It starts, there's a problem. And I agree, it, 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 a quest can be all kinds of things. You know, it can be a quest for love. It can be a quest, you know, it can be a war, but you want to get right to it through the eyes of someone you're interested in following. Yeah. I'll just say one other thing about The Innocence, which I was t mentioning before. The beginning of The Innocence, among the many brilliant things in that movie, the opening credits. So it's that giant wide screen. And then on the left hand side of the screen are, are, are a woman's hands, ostensibly, what we're would later believe they're Deborah Carr's hands, clasped in prayer. And then, and you hear this whispering, this tiny whispering, please, yeah. something the children, something the children. So you're here in your seat and you're like, what's the matter with the children? What's the matter with the children? And she's like, oh, please help the children, please help the children. And you're, so right away, you're just, you're in. So yeah. Joel Silver is right to, to a degree. It doesn't, you know, a factory doesn't have to explode, but you want to pull people in on some little thing that makes you think, well, what's going to happen there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, we have uh, Fritz waiting. Your question is in chat, Fritz, but if you would like to give voice to it, you have the floor. Sure. Uh, to, to, to sort of paraphrase Lincoln, Lincoln uh, said something to the effect once, my best friend is a person who has lent me a book that I ain't read. And so my best friends are often the people who let me know about a director that I'm, I'm not familiar with. And I, I think of the one friend who, who said, there's a guy who's done these short films and um, you're gonna hear about him because he's doing a long, longer film. And his name, a long name, eight names to it, Graf, Florian, so on, so on, so on, von Donnersmark. And this movie is Das Leben der Andern. And so he's still now a really great friend for recommending that. So I love, I love recommendations. So who is a director? 
that we don't know of yet. It's up and coming. And if you could name a film or two that this director has done, love to love to go out there and find a new talent. Well, um, there was a movie that played on television in the last year called I'm Your Woman, directed by Julia Kent, I think is the name. She's made a few other films before. The film didn't get a great deal of attention, even though Rachel Brosnahan, Mrs. Maisel, played the lead. It's a stunning film. I would go for that. There's my recommendation. Uh, I, Thank you. I, I have no unknown recommendations because they're unknown. But I will <laughs> hurl this at you. If you don't know The Lunchbox, do you know The Lunchbox? It, if you oh see it's I've heard it meant I've heard it mentioned and I'm trying to think of where where what I've heard about that it's so wonderful um, it, it it had a proper release but it's not you know uh, by Marvel or anything it it's an absolutely wonderful romantic comedy is not the right word romance um, set in India um, made maybe five years ago uh, yeah a bit more maybe by a wonderful filmmaker uh, whom I know through my work at Sundance. It's really wonderful. I agree, totally agree, yeah. Thank you, wonderful, I really appreciate it. I knew of neither, so this is great. I'll look them both okay. up. Okay, okay. Um, you, you all, were, we're getting close to the home stretch. Bill Schneider, good to see you. Thanks for making time. You had a comment or suggestion in chat. Could I give you the floor? I think I'm muted. Good to see you again, Jeff, after many years. Likewise. Uh, Mayor of Easttown. Everybody I know was hooked on that episode after episode. They couldn't wait for it to come back week after week. I mean, that was a, an amazing film with a wonderful performance by Kate Winslet. Why aren't there more movies like that? Beautifully well, one, written and one, acted. One reason, I'm sure, is that a lot of people who looked at that in project form said, what? That depressing story. And, you know, and Kate Winslet is going to work very hard to look plain or unappealing or unattractive. Uh, you really want to, and, and you want to call it Mayor of East Town? What does that title mean? I mean, the answer is certain people, Kate Winslet notably, I think, said, Yeah, let's do it. I'll take the risk on that. I'll chance it. And you, you can't expect every risk to come off. We mustn't sentimentalize risk. There were a lot of bad films being made, a lot of bad series, but you've got to have a few people with the daring to say, let's go for that. And thank God they went for that. Yes, they did. It was a great film. Yep. I'm often asked, what's the best political movie you ever saw? I've been asked that question about a dozen times. Uh, I used to say advising consent, Otto Preminger's film, because I love the performance by uh, Charles Lawton, who played a jowly Southern senator. The character was named Seb Cooley. It was a wonderful film. But I saw one a few years ago. I don't think it was a very successful film, but I enjoyed it very much called The Ides of March. Have you yeah, seen yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I know the Ides of George Clooney's yeah. film. Yeah with Philip Seymour Hoffman, as I remember. Anyway. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very tough for films, let's call them political films, to rival what's going on night after night on television. So, I, I mean, if you're deeply interested in politics, you watch television now, I think, without question. Yes, I, think that, I think that Advise and Consent, which I saw recently, I think it's a very well-made film. But it's from a different world at a different yes. time. Yes, it is. Very much so. If you really want to see a political film about a different world and a different time, see The Best Man, Gore Vidal's film, about right. a political convention that that world does not exist anymore. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you all, we're, we're almost to conclusion. Is there anybody who hasn't yet spoken, who wants to get into the conversation, has a question or comment. I don't see anybody. I'm going to ask Douglas and David, 
wrap us up here a little bit, push us forward. We've, we've been sentimental and appropriately so. We've recaptured and captured the essence of beautiful things. We've talked a little bit, David, about your writing. Um, what is on your screen for this weekend? And give us some hints or clues about coming season. You, you have insider industry knowledge we don't have. Take us forward a little bit about things that we ought to be looking for that you're going to be watching, immediate future, but also this fall. Well, can I jump in, Doc, quickly? Please. The big movie of this weekend is Chelsea versus Arsenal on Sunday <laughs> afternoon. And I'm, I'm totally serious. I, I, nothing is going to hold me the way that's going to hold me. <laughs> is that black I, and white or color? It'll be color. It'll be wonderful color. And there will be, I think there will be a full crowd in the stadium. So it will be a communal experience. <laughs> well, well, fingers crossed, break a leg and all that sort of thing. Enjoy, David. Douglas, what, what about you? Can you bring us forward and give us some, some tips or some favorites or some, some intuitions you have about the coming weeks and months? Um, uh, no, really. I, I can only say this. I can't think that far ahead anymore. Uh, the pandemic has entirely melted time for me. Um, yep. I, I've lost all, I didn't, I was talking to someone today and I realized apparently it's August now. So I'm, I'm a little <laughs> lost on, I will say this. I know that tonight on Turner, Cla not to be Mr. Pretentious because my taste is not the least bit pretentious, but tonight on Turner Classic Movies, they are showing Ozu's great movie, Late Spring, oh. Oh. which has one of the most beautiful performances uh, in all of acting. I mean, uh, it has many great performances in it, but, but her performance in it is just staggering. The movie has a perfect premise, a father and her, his grown daughter living together. Neither wants to marry because they're afraid the other will be left alone. It's an extraordinarily humane and beautiful film. That's what I would urge people to uh, see. Great choice. Great choice. Well, well, that that is wonderful. And I think that's a lovely way to conclude what, for me, was a stimulating and lovely conversation with both you gentlemen and all of you. You know, I always, I say this occasionally, <clears throat> Douglas and, and David, you know, one feels like a, um, in this era of Zoom, like a purser or a pilot where they say, we know you have your choice of airlines. We know you have your choice of Zoom discussions. And some of us feel a little bit Zoomed out, but to, with this group of such caliber and quality and to spend this time with us is deeply appreciated. And of course the draws were obvious. David and Douglas, that was beautifully done. What a wonderful, it was a treat. I mean, like a kid in a candy store, what a treat. So to you gentlemen, thank you, Sid, Thank you again. And if you all are inclined, those of you who have your cameras off, I think it's a nice gesture to turn your camera on if you're able to, just for a moment to see everybody, to say thank you, to wave and wish a good day and good evening wherever you are. So Douglas McGrath, David Thompson, to see you again. What a pleasure. What a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to be thank here you. with all of you. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Have Thanks a good day. Us. Have a good evening. Bye now. Thank you, Sid. <laughs>